Good morning. Thank you very much for coming out to a beautiful Friday morning. Other things we could be doing, but I appreciate you being here. And uh, I'm going to uh, walk you through some things here this morning, and we will talk about culture and my experience. I do want to make sure you, my wife's here with me, and so I have to be careful what I say. <laughs> make sure it's accurate. So my wife is here. But Jeffrey, after that introduction, I, I, I only got time for about 10 minutes. <laughs> anyway, uh, a little bit of, here's what we're going to do this morning. I'm going to give you a little bit of an overview of our business at Duncan Aviation. It's an unusual business. Not a lot of people have the exposure to it, so we'll spend a few minutes making sure you understand that. And then we'll get into our culture story at Duncan, and I'll tell you kind of the, how, the history of how our culture has come to be. And then I, we'll spend the last few minutes talking about my leadership journey, and I can tell you some of the uh, things I've learned along the way. Uh, be, uh, anxious to share that with you and then if we have a few minutes at the end I'll be happy to take any questions so our company Duncan Aviation as uh, Jeffrey said we started in Lincoln Nebraska in 1956 so this is our 60th anniversary and it's always been a family-owned business still family-owned it was started by Donald and then uh, when I started uh, I originally worked for Robert who you see on the left there and uh, now his son Todd is our chairman Todd turned 50 this year and uh, still very much family owned and operated and it, it has kind of a family feel. So <clears throat> Robert uh, has been known over the years as being a, uh, an art lover. He's a guy who's been collecting art for a lot of years and he loves making a statement with art. You see his personal airplane here. He's an avid uh, flyer. Uh, this little citation which uh, we designed and painted to his preference um, it looks like it's splotchy paint. It's pretty cool looking, actually. We call it the green machine. And he's actually flown that around the world and on an art buying tour. So um, quite an avid uh, pilot there, Robert is. Todd, uh, who's our chairman now, as I said, just turned 50, his wife Connie, and he has two boys, Harrison and PK, who we think will be coming up to continue the family legacy in the business as we move ahead. Company, as I said, 60 years old. Um, very solid future as we look out at, at our business, healthy, expanding. Uh, we're a bit over 500 million in revenue and, and that number is growing. 2,000 plus employees. When I started it was a little less than 150. So it's been an interesting change that we've seen over the years in multiple locations. Here's kind of uh, what our map looks like. Everything <coughs> we do, every location we have is in North America. Uh, the ones with the circles around them, there are, are large facilities where we have complete capabilities that I'll tell you about here in just a few minutes. Um, obviously, we're based in that Battle Creek, uh, Michigan location, our headquarters in Lincoln, and now we have a, another full-service location in Provo, Utah. Uh, the other sites that you see there are smaller locations where we have people based in most of the airports uh, where business jets come and go a lot uh, around the country. And that, that group is expanding as we speak. So as you can see, we, we're trying to touch our customers wherever they are in North America. We also touch most of the international market. But in our industry, the airplanes are mobile. So at this point, it works best for us to have them come to us. And we have many of them do that from all over the world. And so we haven't had to have locations outside the United States. We do have some salespeople but haven't had locations. That way we don't have to deal with uh, you know, cultures and environments and regulations that are different than what we have here. So our business, if I were to describe it, is, would be this. If you take a business jet, we'll, we'll show you some pictures of kind of what we work on. But a business jet in its life, which can be well over 30 years, everything that that, that machine needs to have happen to it, we do. Okay? So for that operator of the airplane, whether it be heavy maintenance or refurbishment or modification, we do all of those things. So to some degree, we're kind of like a big hospital for aircraft mm -hmm. because people come to us for all of the specialties in one place. Okay. So um, <clears throat> we'll talk about business jets for a second here. Um, it's, a, it's a world that I've lived in for almost 40 years. It's new to a lot of people. Some of you have probably spent some time on business jets, but just as a primer, these are smaller jets that typically anywhere from four to 12 passengers. Um, uh, they can be expensive. 
um, but they are a, a transportation tool. Um, the interesting thing about them is, is they, they typically have a lifespan that's anywhere from 30 to 40 years, and some beyond that. Uh, it's, it's a fairly um, recent industry, because business jets came on the scene in probably 1965. It's kind of when Bill Lear and, and some of those people started actually introducing that small jet into the industry. So we're, we're working on airplanes today that were built back in, the, in that time. So it's an interesting world. It's not a big world. Um, worldwide, there are about 20,000 of these aircraft. And if you look at those that are under the age of 25 years, there's probably less than, less than 15,000 of them. So it's a small world, and we know where all of them are. So we'll make it our business <laughs> to know where they are. Um, customers, as you might imagine, we have a lot of interesting customers, the operators and owners of these aircraft. Um, I should just say this, most of them are fairly demanding. They like getting what they want. And uh, here's a picture of our world. If, if you were to compare us to the medical world, as I just made that comparison, we live in a world that's fairly stressful, fairly fast-paced because of what we do, these high-dollar assets that people want to use. It'd be a little bit like <clears throat> if you went in for a big procedure, heart surgery, and the surgeon sat down with you with his team and said, this is going to take 12 hours to do this, and it's very complicated, and here's how it's going to work. And, what our customer would say was, well, Mr. Surgeon, can you cut two hours off of that? Because I've got things I've got to do. And that's kind of the world we live in. Everything is fast paced. Um, it's not uncommon for us to spend $500 getting a $3 O-ring to the facility because we need to get the airplane going. So we live in a world that's a bit uh, fast paced and, and there is some stress involved with it, but it's a lot of fun. These people and some of the airplanes I'll show you pictures of are people that you would know, uh, entertainers that you would know. Uh, we try to honor their privacy when they're there. Um, just some pictures of the kinds of aircraft we work on, some small aircraft, a little Citation Mustang there, a, a Citation Bravo here made by Textron or Cessna as we grew up knowing them, uh, a, a Bombardier product, this is a, a Challenger, uh, this is a, I think a 605. Um, Oh, excuse me there. Uh, this is what Jeffrey referred to, the Dassault Falcon 7X, which now you're getting into the longer range aircraft. This is an airplane we launched one here a couple of years ago, full of people, and it went from Battle Creek to Ni Nigeria nonstop. Wow. Well, that airplane will, will go a long way. So we, we have one customer that uh, lives in Geneva, Switzerland, and commutes to LA in this airplane once a week and back and forth. So that's an interesting commute. It may be less stressful than your commute. <laughs> um, but a, a great airplane, um, a, a Bombardier Global Express. This is another long range airplane that you could go from Chicago to Tokyo nonstop if you chose. A lot of companies are using these when they're doing a lot of their international business as they do that. So, as I said, we do almost everything to the airplane in a heavy way. Uh, maintenance is a big part of what we do. I took this picture yesterday. This is an airplane in our hangar in, in Battle Creek. You can see the, both wings are off, all the paint's off, the landing gear's gone, uh, the interior's all gone, and, and that's very common for what we do at, the, at that level. <clears throat> Obviously, in an airplane, this airplane is probably a, about a 25-year-old airplane. Um, like all things, they, as they age, they start having issues. Just like we as human beings start having issues with cancer and things like that, Airplanes are like cars, you start seeing corrosion issues. It's all fixable, but it all takes effort and expertise to fix it, to make it right. And you definitely want your airplane fixed right before you get on it, right? So a lot of, a lot of effort there on airframe and engine maintenance. Here's uh, one of our engine techs. Uh, where's Caitlin there? Okay, that's uh, Over here. Jonathan, got him? Okay. Caitlin, uh, who's a structure tech employee, this is her brother who works for us in Battle Creek, one of our engine techs, Jonathan. So, um, typical look at one of our five hangars. They're all pretty much um, packed like this all the time. Space is the issue for us. The airplanes continue to get bigger and bigger, and so it takes more and more space to put them in there. So, uh, We do a lot of modification work. As you can imagine, with technology changes and things, over the 30 to 35 year span on the aircraft, there's a lot of changes that need to be made from time to time to keep up with the technology. 
These our three technicians here have just ended, they're finishing up a project here where we've taken the whole instrument panel out, put a new instrument panel in, put all new flat, big flat panels of the latest navigation equipment in the airplane. <coughs> We, as the airplanes have gotten bigger, we get more involved in cabin management and enter entertainment systems. And so a lot of wiring harnesses and a lot of complexity that we get involved with there uh, putting in the airplane. Uh, we do a lot of refurbishment of the aircraft, interior and exterior. Um, some shots here of our teams that do this. This is a, an interesting world because there's no place that trains these people to do this. So we have to train them ourselves to do this high level work that, that uh, Shepard was referring to. So paint world, we paint uh, in Battle Creek, we paint about 100 aircraft a year. Our Lincoln facility paints about the same number. Um, you see some shots here of some of the work going on when we paint aircraft with actually stripping the paint and then putting the primers back on and then uh, stripe layouts and everybody's got their own scheme. We have designers on staff that help people with that design work. Uh, here's kind of the way one would look when it's, when it's done. Um, and some of them have interesting paint jobs. Here's a, a job we did last uh, year for Richard Branson. This is his galactic gal, he calls it. And uh, he likes the big eyeball on the tail and on the bottom. So obviously our painters had an interesting time putting that on. So those are the kinds of things we end up with a lot of interesting, uh, unique paint jobs that we do. Interior-wise, obviously we have all the expertise for all that upholstery work and all that high leather level leather that uh, Jeffrey was talking about, interior panels, um, all the cabinet work we, we build, uh, we modify, we um, recondition the cabinets, uh, and obviously a lot of that takes finish work, so we have a lot of people, we probably have 40 people that just do finish work, putting finishes on cabinets, what they do. It would be kind of a finished product for us. This was a South African airplane that we did uh, a couple years ago. But you can see the look and the feel of it. Everything in there that you see, we did. So, uh, Jeffrey talked about the fact that we have we do have done completion work. Completion work is when the manufacturer will build an airplane, and, but they don't finish it themselves. They'll bring it to a facility like ours. And so this aircraft came from France with the interior looking like this. And so our engineers uh, engineered, our designers designed and then we fabricated everything that's gonna go in that airplane and it probably about four or five months after it was at, arrived at our facility, it left looking like this. So, uh, this, I don't know, Jeffrey, I don't think this is the one you were in, but it was something like that, exactly. But uh, a lot of expertise in our, our craftspeople there. It's really, really fun to work with them. So, as, as we said, obviously, we are known worldwide 25% uh, of our business comes from outside the United States, and uh, we have a very strong reputation, a very strong brand. We're known for having a great culture. That's really one of our competitive advantages, uh, why people come. They love our people. They love walking through the hangars. They, they like what they feel there. And obviously, if you're going to have your airplane worked on, you want it worked on by somebody who likes what they're doing and is good at what they're doing. You don't want somebody coming in who's upset or mad at the world working on your airplane. Right? <laughs> so culture is a big part of, of who we are and, and what we do. And for that reason, we've been recognized for many years and continue to be recognized as a great place to work. Um, starting in the year 2000 when we were on the Fortune uh, Top 100 list. Um, so and we have always been recognized, not always, but for a long time we've been recognized as a great place to work. So let's transition and talk about culture because that's kind of important to us at Duncan Aviation. That's important, as you said, as a competitive advantage for us. So let's talk about how we got to the place where we have this great culture. And if we just think about culture in general, every organization has culture, right? Every family has culture, every church has culture, every business, every nonprofit, Cultures like your nose, everybody has one, okay? But some of them are good and some of them aren't good, right? Culture is that combination of personality that your organization has, okay? And it could be a flight department like Nathan runs or it could be a large organization. As I said, it could be just a few people or it could be uh, 2,000 people like we've got. Usually the more people you have, the more complicated it gets to kind of keep that culture where you want it. 
But the thing about culture is, as I said, it can be, it can be bad, but it can also be good. And the question is, how do, we, how do we take culture and move it in a direction where it begins to work for us instead of against us? Because it can work against you, can't you? We've all had the experience of whether you're going to a store or some point, place of business and you're treated poorly and you, you wonder, wow, I don't think I'm ever going to go back there again. You just interacted with some of the culture of that place coming through a person or people that either caused you to do business or to go away from a place and not do business. So that's why culture is important. That's why it's been important for us. We are a service business and our customers have free roam of our hangars and so they can experience our culture every day, right? They have free access to all of our people. That sounds a little risky, doesn't it? You know? Sometimes, at least in the manufacturing world, a lot of the people who are working back there, the customer doesn't have direct contact with. But in our world, it's direct contact. So it's important to us. So for us, let me take you back to a little bit of our history here, the beginning of our culture. Uh, as I said, I started in 1979, but I'm going to take you back to the mid-90s, a little over 20 years ago. And we were a, we were a good company then, but we had a fractured culture. Um, we had some good culture, as a lot of organizations do. You'll have pockets that are good, some have pockets that are bad, and we had that back in the early 90s. As my, my wife remembers, we had senior leadership back then that really was not very good and, and really uh, lend, lent itself to poor culture. We did have some, some pockets of good culture in the company. But in 1994, a group of us got together and decided, let's write down what it is when we're good, what does that look like? You know, when, when our culture is good, what does that look like? And so we actually, there, a group of middle managers got together, and we, I remember we were in the back of a Learjet coming back from Colorado, and we were writing this stuff down. And it didn't describe the whole company. Some of it was a little bit aspirational, but it was a description of who we thought we were Okay. And so what it was was a recognition at that point, at least at that level, that that culture was important. We knew for the future of the company at that middle management level that, that was important to us. Okay. Um, the thing we did that was interesting that I would encourage everybody to do is write it down. Okay. Don't just talk about it. Write it down. There's something about writing something down that helps you kind of um, crystallize it in your mind and stuff. And it was really a thoughtful description of who we are. Let me show you what we wrote down, okay? So, and I should tell you this, this is the list that we use today. It's only, we've only changed about six words of this in the last uh, 22 years, okay? So, this doesn't feel like marketing speak. Um, it's just kind of who we are, okay? So I'll read through this. At Duncan Aviation, we, all of us, deliver high quality products and services. That's kind of the basis. We charge fair prices and we provide efficient turn times. This is kind of in our mind. This is who we see ourselves being. We lead through action and innovation. So key words in there, leadership, action, innovation. We're not comfortable to wait for something to happen. We want to figure out better ways and new ways of doing it. That's kind of in our DNA. We focus on solutions rather than problem. And that's a really big one for us because often what we're doing <coughs> on the airplanes, we're doing it before anybody else ever has and sometimes we find issues. We sometimes describe it this way. When we're doing inspection work and things on the airplanes, it's like going on a dragon hunt. Sometimes you find a dragon. Right? Now, for customers, when you find a dragon, they don't want you to describe the dragon. They want to know how you're going to kill it, right? They want solutions. So it's important for us to be solution-based, and we are. We respect others and are accountable for our actions. This is kind of how we interact with one another. Respect, accountability. We maintain a team approach, and we also offer positive suggestions. Teamwork is huge for us. We value honesty, integrity, loyalty, and trust. That's kind of the the bottom line for people that are going to be in our, our organization. We support our communities, we maintain our health, we respect the environment, and we're darn proud to be the best. Okay. So these are our core values that we wrote down, as I said, about 22 years ago. 
and they have continued to be that way. Now, I should tell you this, the core values um, are a tool for leaders. Now, at this point in our history, we didn't have a very good leadership team. So this set of values sort of sat and didn't get used a lot for several years. Because core values are an awesome tool for leader to use because they can be used for hiring. They, you know, they're, they're sort of a, okay, we want to hire people that fit this list. Okay, you can use it for orientation and training, make sure people understand what the expectation is. You can use it as a foundation for customer issue resolution. You can use it as a, a foundation for employee resolution, how you're going to treat your employees. And it, we actually use it as a guide for strategic planning. But back in this day, um, we didn't have the leadership team in place that we needed to do that. So we developed the core values, but the next few years we began a movement that was important for us where we began to embrace those core values. And it really started uh, probably later on in the 90s when our, our owner at the time, Robert Duncan, saw the need to replace the senior leadership in the company. He would admit that it took him longer than he should. We had some senior leaders that really didn't have a lot of integrity. They, they weren't caring for our people. Um, they were in it for themselves. And so he replaced them and brought in uh, Aaron Hilkerman, who's our, still our current president. And Aaron came in with more of a focus on the value of leadership and the, the importance of people. And he understood both of those and began building uh, a leadership team that would understand the importance of our people. And uh, Robert, at the same time, we were learning about the value of, uh, of people. So this transition was happening for us in the, late, in the late 90s. And Robert came to that conclusion. Aaron was on board. We were, he was building a leadership team that was more effective. And we, we made this switch to where we began to realize that our employees really were the most important thing for us. Because like, as Robert said, prior to that, we had been, Mr. Customer, whatever you want is what we need to do. And that makes a lot of sense for us in business, right? What, in our business, what we began to realize was if you put those employees first, they're gonna take care of the customer, right? If you've got good, strong employees who are engaged, they're gonna take care of those customers. So it's a subtle shift, but a very important one that really began to propel that culture that we were building at the time here. So we saw that that, that key was those strong, engaged employees. And the other thing we began to realize, if you think about having great employees, it really takes good leadership. So it's all about hiring and leadership and, and, and building people up, but it does take great leaders. Good leaders create healthy, winning culture. Okay? That's really the secret of where good culture comes from. It comes from the leaders, because the leaders are the ones who build that workforce and, uh, and keep it going. Okay? So good leaders are necessary for business growth. That's what we began to realize and really began to embrace back in that day. So good leaders are also the ones who take those core values, which describes who you are and who you want to be, and use that and make that happen. Okay? It's the same whether it's in your family or your church organization or anything else. It's the leadership that sets that tone, right? If you have a poor culture, you have to look at the leadership. Because culture, left by itself, will degrade down to the lowest level, won't it? It takes somebody to set the standard for where we want that culture to be, and that's the leaders. So what we began to realize was that the next step was to work on our leadership, to continue to build that leadership group, and to educate that leadership group and make sure those people knew what this culture needed to be. So uh, what we did next, and this was probably in uh, 1999, I think was our first one here, maybe in 2000, we actually came up with a set of leadership values, which were a bit different than our core values. Okay? It was a higher set of values that we realized that our leaders needed to be held to a higher standard. Right? So if they were going to support those core values, so values that support drive the culture, values that support employee success, values that our leaders understand and embrace. Okay. So as the company's growing, you've got more and more leaders. They might be team leaders, they might be managers, they might be senior leaders. We've all we've got lots of leaders. So we've got to make sure that they're all 
getting us on board. So here's the, the leadership value list that we put together back in 2000. Okay? And you'll see this has a little bit of a feel of the others, but it is different. It's a little higher level. At Duncan Aviation, we believe that leadership means that we truly care about each team member. We support and develop each team member's career. And we listen and communicate continuously. Huge part of being a good leader. We encourage teamwork within and among all teams, not just in your team, but across teams, right? That collaboration piece. We focus on an individual's strengths, okay? Everybody's wired uniquely, okay? So we need to make sure that that unique wiring is in the right place so that person can feel good about what they're doing. We celebrate success, okay? That's an important part of it. We provide timely and helpful feedback. We focus on continuous improvement, and we have fun. So bottom here says, leaders at Duncan Aviation accomplish these values by possessing character, honesty, and integrity with a continuous commitment to serve both employees and customers. It's interesting for our business, if you look at that, there's no mention of airplanes in there, is there? There's not even any mention of profit. There's no mention of, of business stuff. It's all about the people. So you see what we were doing in this case, we were really putting our, our money where our mouth was when we said our employees are going to be best. Our employees got to come first. Okay? So the next, what came out of this in, in the early 2000s, we began to focus more on leadership training. We said, if this is important, we need to get all of our leaders to understand it. We had leaders who maybe been in positions for 10 years, 15 years, 20 years, had old habits, old ideas, as we all have in, in our organizations, and it was a time to start getting people to understand the new way, so to speak, okay? So we started with some outside training vendors that were a pretty good fit, and then we started developing our own classes where we began to teach values and ethics and things like that ourselves. And I would suggest this to you. If you want to have a strong set of values in your company, have your leaders teach it, okay? Most of us understand, and uh, I think they say that if you're going to, uh, you need to hear something about eight times before you get it. But you know, what they say is if you hear something and then you teach it, you get it much quicker. So one of the things we've done is had our leaders teach um, these leadership values and our core values. So we put together a leadership development program. And now, this hasn't all happened overnight. It started in the mid-2000s, and we've continued to grow and add <coughs> classes as we've We've done this, and um, there are currently three levels of classes. I was in Lincoln last Friday teaching this uh, Mastering Business Acumen class. Uh, it's, great, it's, a, it's, it's a great investment that we do, but it is a big investment of time and money for our people. So let's talk about these values at work, okay? Swedish proverb here, a good friend of mine gave me. I hope it's a Swedish proverb. It sounds good. Um, in calm waters, every ship as a good captain. And obviously, the idea there is it takes a good storm to really prove who's good. Right? So we, we, and we prove our leadership and we prove our connection to those values when the times get tough. right? And every day as you go through um, struggles and, and challenges and economies, ups and downs and customer issues, your attachment to those values is, has to be proven. And so as leaders, we have to remind ourselves, well, how should we handle this? What would our values say? You know, what's the right thing to do? And so the storms help us get stronger as we, <coughs> as we work through this culture issue. Okay? So what's a, a, a winning culture look like? In our company, here's what it looks like. A strong, unified <coughs> leadership team. Now, I will tell you this, we've got a lot of diverse people in our leadership team. That doesn't necessarily mean we always agree on everything. But we always come out of the meetings together, right? In the meetings, there's a lot of robust dialogue, okay? And we have that ability to be able to disagree in the right way. Um, diverse styles, we expect our leaders to live our core values in both good and bad times. And we expect this at all levels, whether you're a team leader of a small group, or a manager of a large department, or a senior manager, we expect everybody to do that. 
we're very intentional about communication, very intentional, because for people, um, you know, if, if, if you don't have the right information for people, we naturally, we tend to fill in the blanks with things that we probably shouldn't do that. We all do that, don't we? So it's important for leaders to be intentional about communication. We have a lot of things that we do in the company that keep that, that, that listening and that communicating going back and forth. Things like uh, hangar walks and team lunches, culture audits that we do. Um, so we're making sure that we're staying in touch with what our people are feeling and thinking. We spend a lot of time on things like salary reviews. You know, every salary in our company is reviewed by at least four people every year to make sure it fits with the performance and where it is in the company so that we know that everybody's proper that way. Uh, other evidence of a winning culture, this is part of our family deal, is that commitment to reinvesting in our people. And you see that by reinvesting in equipment and tooling that they use to make their job easier, uh, facilities, hangars, uh, things like that. I heard uh, our president say last week that if we look back over the last 20 years, we've invested 80% of the profits back into the company to help people succeed. As we said, education and training, um, these leadership training classes we do, of course, in our business, we have to do a lot of technical training. There's a lot of that that goes on. We spend two or three million dollars a year just sending people to technical schools. Um, but then this leadership training <coughs> and personal development training is a huge part of what we do. And probably in the last few years, we've trained over 500 of our leaders and up and coming people with potential on these values that you see here today. Okay. Uh, celebration, fun events, uh, a lot of companies do that. We, we're, we're, uh, we have a lot of fun doing that. So, as I said, we're in a pretty high paced business, so we have to make sure that we do this and have a good time doing it. Uh, years of service lunches, a lot of companies do that. Um, we do them with a lot of fun in fun places. So, uh, what we started doing about 10 years ago was. If, if your employees are important to you, then we want them to be healthy. We want them to be healthy physically, mentally, um, in, in all those ways. If they feel good, uh, we want them to be healthy outside of work as well as inside work. So we invested in a wellness program. We have workout centers in the facilities, uh, full-time wellness people there uh, that can help coach them. And then a few years ago, we actually added uh, medical clinics in the facilities for our people so that it's easy for them to get uh, 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 medical assistance and obviously this works in our favor. Uh, you, most of us go to our local doctor and you're lucky to get 15 minutes, right? You know, um, Here you can go and our uh, nurse practitioner can spend a half hour with them. They may come in with a sore throat or an earache and they can say, well, let's check your blood pressure and let's see how you're doing everywhere else. And sometimes you find things that you can help somebody address early on in a, in a medical clinic. Uh, we're proud of the fact that we've got an organization we call Silver Wings. Robert and Karen Duncan sort of run this, and anybody that's been at the company for 25 years or more becomes a member. And uh, they have uh, pretty fun parties about every 18 months. And your initiation, you get a nice custom-made leather jacket uh, that's, that says Silver Wings on it. So there you see one of our guys in Battle Creek get his jacket. So. So that's a, a bit of the history of how we've gotten to where we're at. And I would say this, culture is never, never easy. It takes work every day to keep it going. Because you think about your, your workforce, you know, even at our lo low turnover rate, you have new people coming in all the time, and so new people with different ideas are coming in. So you would always have to be helping people understand what that expectation is. You always have to be training your new leaders as they come up with what their responsibilities are to maintain that culture and to keep it going. Okay? So, core values is where we started, a standard for all employees. Write them down, embrace them, use them. Make sure that your leadership uses them. Make sure they're real. Um, you can use them as a marketing tool, but honestly, if you want them to impact your culture, it has to be something you use that's meaningful to your people. Leadership needs to get their priorities right, okay, as we did back in the late 90s. Uh, leadership values for us were important, setting that higher standard for your leaders, and then make sure you train your leaders for that. Write them down, have your leaders teach them, and uh, lead by them, okay? And then stay in balance. 
live your values daily. You know, we have them up on the wall, and a lot of our offices have them up. We refer to them a lot, uh, you know, when we're having issues of something, what would our values, according to our values, we should do this, or I was in a meeting just yesterday where we talked about focusing on solutions rather than the problems, because our, sometimes our tendency is one to focus on the problem. So we're always using those to kind of keep ourselves above the line, so to speak. So discipline, accountability, and teamwork are required. So that's a little bit about our story, about our culture, this our history. I'm not sure how it works for you, but that's about uh, that's where we've been with it um, uh, for a lot of years here. So a little bit about me. <clears throat> I've been, as Jeffrey alluded to, I started the company in 1979 when Viv and I were fairly newly married and. Uh, we moved to Lincoln, Nebraska, where I started as a technician on the floor, a mechanic, uh, as an A&P. I had worked my way through college engineering school as a flight instructor and had decided that, um, uh, you know, as Nathan knows, sometimes as a pilot, sometimes you're gone when you don't want to be, right? And uh, that's just the life. So I decided to take the other route and, and do the maintenance side. It's worked out well for me over the years. But uh, maintenance, then in the, in the sales organization and customer service, and and eventually in the, in the senior, senior leadership. Um, the personal, the, the discussion about values and company values for me um, is an easy one because I come, I come from a foundation of really strong personal values. And I'll tell you my story just a little bit is that um, <clears throat> for me, uh, my journey on personal values started when I was late in high school. And I went to a, a private school on the East Coast, living away from home, and uh, a friend there um, confronted me and asked me if I was a Christian. And, you know, I had grown up going to church and, and doing things, but I, I got to thinking about it and talking to my friend John, and I realized that I certainly wasn't a Christian the way I was understanding him to be a Christian. For him, it was very personal. It was a part of his life. It was, it was driving him every day. It was helping him. Um, and even at that age of uh, 17 or 17 and a half that I was, John yeah. confronted me and he asked me if I was a Christian. I said, well, I'm not so sure. And John led me to understand that actually being a Christian is, is actually about starting a personal relationship with Jesus Christ, where you actually come and realize that you can't do this on your own and that you need to turn to Jesus Christ as your Savior um, for your whole life. And you begin to know him as a person. And you actually have a chance to know God personally. And I did that back in that day when I was late in high school and actually committed my life to Christ. And man, did that make a difference. What a change that made. Because all of a sudden your eyes are opened to a lot of the things around you that start making more sense about the way people are, about the way things are about why things aren't as good as they should be. And throughout my career, that has helped me um, progress. It's been the foundation of my marriage to Viv, foundation of our family, the foundation of my work at Duncan Aviation. It's, the, it's that foundation that helps me through those ups and downs in the business, those ups and downs in the personal relationships to help me continue progressing forward. So that Following Jesus Christ for me has provided me with that personal foundation. My suggestion to you, we've talked about core values for a company. Um, that may be important for you to give some thought to and to apply in your situation. But what about your personal foundation? What about your personal values that you have? Because I'm convinced that you're not going to succeed and enjoy life without a good, strong, personal foundation that comes through knowing Jesus Christ. So with that, I'm going to stop. I appreciate you giving me a few minutes to tell my story as well as the company stories and see if there are any, we have time for a few questions? All right. Any questions about uh, any of this I've talked about? Yeah, Jeff? Tom, you've got 2,000 employees. A about 2,100 now, right. And they all walk in the door with their own personal foundations. They do, yeah. So uh, you mentioned some of the old habits that the leadership had and uh, what would be some of those old habits that perhaps their personal foundation led them to believe that was yeah. the right way to go and they conflicted 
with your company's uh, core values or your company culture? Yeah, that's a great, great question. And I'll talk about kind of one big one that you tend to see in people. And that's that sort of um, protecting their own turf. As leaders, you see sometimes people grow up and they feel like, I got here to this position, this is my position, and now this is my world. And uh, to some degree, sometimes they want to protect that. They can be threatened by somebody else who they feel is coming up strongly. And, and sometimes a leader will inadvertently, maybe not even intentionally, hold others back because they feel threatened by that. Um, in our culture, what we encourage people to do is to train their successor and to find people who are going to be better than they, they are. Um, because we, we say, as long as you do that, you will always have a good position in this company because there will always be something for you to do here. And so what happens in our place is people sort of lose that fear of losing their position. Okay? And that's, that's a difficult one for people old school. You want to protect what you've got. Um, and we all kind of do that naturally, right? Do that. So that's one that we, we always have to address with people, helping them to understand that it's about, their success is about helping others succeed, not so much about themselves. Uh, you know, sometimes it's, it's a little bit about, uh, being a, a family-owned organization, we can do this. Sometimes we have to get our leaders to understand it's not always about profits. It's about taking care of our employees and eventually making sure that customer has a great experience. But not everybody in your organization is a Christian, right? Absolutely right, yeah. And actually, even the Duncan family, um, you know, they're not uh, necessarily church-going, professing people like that. But they're good family people, and they understand the value of people. And uh, it has allowed people like myself to take my foundation and help others grow and, and progress through it. So good, thanks. Yes? On two slides, you saw the phrase cultural audit. Yeah. How do you do it? What do you look for? What do you do with the results? Yeah, we've, uh, we actually started that. We got our first taste of it when we did the Fortune Top 100 thing back in the year 2000. Because they come to you when, you when you enter into those sort of uh, situations with a, in a sense, a survey. And they wanted it to go to all of our people and you had to have so many people fill it out. It was kind of a culture audit. That was our first exposure to it. We began to see what they were doing. Um, uh, several years after that, we tried to do it ourselves with our own questions and that we would send out to our people. Uh, in the last few years, we've gone with a company that's called Workplace Dynamics, which I think is somewhere in Pennsylvania. They're a company that specializes in a cultural audit, and they've, they've done all the science and understanding of how to do that. They come in, we customize it a little bit for our use. We do it typically every 18 months, and it's done our, our our employees can go online and they do it anonymously, but it allows us then through these different categories that they give us to, to gauge engagement, uh, what people are feeling about the leaders above them, what they're feeling about stress in the workplace. And it, it's one of many tools that we use. It's not perfect. The challenge with a culture audit is, is it really depends on the day that the person takes the audit. You know, what was going on that week? You know, was it highly stressful? Was it, you know, what was going on? Because you're, you're really trying to get inside their heads. But we've had great experience with it. People have the chance to put in all their comments and things, and then we give that to our leaders. Our leaders can see their area. We can see if we have pockets that aren't working as well as we'd like, that we can then come up with a, a way to address those. So anyway, yeah, Sergio? Uh, why Battle Creek? Uh, interesting question. Uh, there's some history there, you know, as we grew up in the business over the years uh, from Lincoln, there was a company we would compete with that was based in Kalamazoo called Calero. And they grew up, uh, we grew up working on Learjets, they grew up working on Citations. And they were uh, usually a bit behind us as far as uh, age and growth, um, but we would compete with them. And uh, about, uh, well it was 1997, the ownership of that business felt like you know they were getting to a, the years where they were worried about the future and they actually entered into discussions with us about buying the company and so we bought the company in 1998 uh, which is interesting those of you that live in the football world that was the that was the year that 
one of the only year I remember when Michigan and Nebraska shared the national championship. So in that year, we bought our Michigan company. <laughs> and so we had t-shirts made with that. <laughs> Both number one type thing. And so that's how we ended up in, in, uh, in Kalamazoo and Battle Creek. The Kalamazoo business had built a facility in Battle Creek, which is where we are now. So, yeah. But they had a culture already, right? So they the did. integration of those two cultures must have been, what, a 10-year journey to uh, integrate was, those two? It, it, it continues, but it, it probably wasn't 10 years. They had a bit more of a military sort of a structure yeah. because the ownership was very, very military thinking and as far as their uh, hierarchy. And uh, the, what the people would say in, in our facility, there are probably still as, as many as 120 that are still with us from that. Um, they would tell you that they, they had a good culture before, an okay culture, but the culture got dramatically better within the next two years as Duncan took over. And we began this process of applying this culture through leadership training and, and communication and things like that to the facility. It was an interesting time to do that. Have you acquired other companies? Um, very small ones, but uh, nothing of that size. So they were 300, I think, when we acquired them. Now we're about 600. So. Thank you for watching this presentation. Perhaps you've never made a Christian commitment. We want to give you that opportunity today. Just a few easy steps. First of all, recognize your need. The Bible tells us that in Romans 3.23, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. All of us are sinners and must recognize our need for a Savior. By confessing our sins and turning from them, we will find forgiveness. The Bible promises in 1 John 1.9, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and righteous to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Believe in Jesus. God wrought a miracle when he sent his only son to die that we might have life. Put your faith in him and believe in his power to save you. The Bible says in John 3.16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. God has given us a great gift in his Son, but we must receive this gift. Thank him for loving and forgiving you, and ask him to live in your heart. His promise to us is clear. In John 1.12, the Bible says, But as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become children of God. So Jesus is the atonement, the sacrificial lamb, the remission of sins, just as if we'd never sinned, and the forgiveness. Through Jesus we have daily forgiveness. And having received his salvation, confess your faith. The Bible assures us in Romans 10.9, if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. You know, we're all going to die and spend eternity somewhere, either in heaven or in hell. We want to give you the opportunity to pray with us today. Let's bow our head. Lord, I recognize my need for you as my Savior. I confess my sins to you now and I turn from them and I ask for your forgiveness, Lord. I believe in you, Lord Jesus, that you died for me, that I might have eternal life with you in heaven. Lord Jesus, I receive you now in my heart, and I thank you for forgiving me. I thank you 
that you love me. I thank you that you receive me into your kingdom. I believe in my heart that you are my Lord and that God raised you from the dead, that I might be saved and spend eternity with you. I thank you, Lord, that I am now part of God's family and I commit my life to you from this day forward. Amen. And if you've prayed that prayer with us, we encourage you to share that with someone today. Thank you.